here. Um, but welcome to the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, we are partner with the AHEC and our mission statement is there for you to take a look. And as we go ahead and get started, if you could make sure those in the audience, uh, make sure that your microphone is muted as we go ahead and get started and also just remain attentive and engaged in the session. Towards the end of the session in the chat box, I will be putting a link to help provide feedback for our speakers. So if you could help us out with that. Also for those who are claiming CME credit, this is your code for today. Um, there's a new code for each presentation date. So just make sure you text this activity code um, to the number provided there before midnight tonight. I will go through here on the next slide for those who maybe haven't done so yet. Um, if you haven't registered, just text your email address to the number listed here. And then after that, you should receive a confirmation. And from that point forward, you just text attend and then the code for that day, which is listed here for you. But any issues with that, please feel free to reach out to me. Also, just make sure if you are claiming credits that you do check your CME transcript every so often, and that can be done at the CME office website listed here. Um, please feel free though to reach out to them or myself. Those who are members of the AAFP are also able to claim credits through their system. Um, but again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. We also wanna make sure that we do mention that it is the goal of our Grand Rounds presentation um, to meet these nationally established physician core competencies. So you can see those listed, listed here. And I will let Dr. Hamada go ahead and share his screen now and get started. All right, can you see my screen? Perfect. All right, well, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you everyone for having me today. My name is uh, Mohammed Hamada. I'm one of the interventional and structural uh, cardiologists. I joined University of Texas recently. I was trained at the Cleveland Clinic as well as Emory University, and I spent one year of my life doing uh, valve disease at the Minneapolis Heart before I joined the group almost like a year now. And I would like to, we started a new service uh, for structural heart disease at the hospital. We talked to multiple subspecialty in the hospital, mainly internal medicine, uh, ICU team, as well as a neurology team. I would like to talk to you about uh, the new treatment and the new options that are available for your patient that we can help you with. And hopefully we can take care of the patients together. So uh, we review new frontiers in the structural heart disease. I'm gonna make it, uh, I'm gonna present cases. I want this to be pertinent to your practice as much as possible. Please feel free to uh, feel free to ask me any questions and interrupt me during the presentation if you have any questions or any comments. So I don't have any conflicts of interest. So we review uh, quickly the neuro innovations and structural heart disease, uh, what interventions that we can offer to our patients, such as transcatheter aortic valve replacement, mitra clip, angiovac for those with endocarditis, uh, closure for the left atrial appendage, and those with AFib, as well as a PFO closure. And we'll talk a little bit about secondary prevention for stroke. Our structural heart team, uh, eight members, uh, four interventional cardiologists. This is myself, uh, Mohamed. My partner, Dr. Almomani, is also trained in structural heart disease. I think some of you might have interacted with him over the last two years. He joined about two or three years ago. Dr. Prasad is our cath lab director, and we work closely with our surgeons, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Huey, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carpenter now retired, but Dr. Sacco is, uh, is all, uh, also very helpful. We have a valve meeting every, every Tuesday. We discuss all of the cases. We have a surgical input, we have interventional cardiology input, and we quite often invite people to attend our valve meeting. Like if you have a patient that, that is complex and you would like to have advocates for your patient to take to get a certain procedures or to take into to provide input for the team, you are all welcome to do so. So the first scenario is a common scenario you probably encountered in your clinic, 75 year old lady. She came to us, she had a syncopal episode. Uh, when you examine her, you noted that she has a significant murmur over the, like the upper ster sternum border, three over six in severity. The murmur is late peaking. 
and we got an echo as part of regular workup and she was diagnosed with severe aortic valve stenosis. Her main gradient of the study was 45 millimeter mercury. So we'll talk a little bit of the aortic stenosis. This is one of the major procedure that had a paradigm shift uh, during over the last uh, several years. So usually these patients have, um, they stay asymptomatic for a long time before they, they start to, to have symptoms. And as we notice here, uh, Dr. Brownworld, he was the first to describe the severe aortic valve stenosis. And by the time the patient have symptoms, the prognosis becomes very poor. So if the patient presents with angina, usually the patient, uh, the survival drops to about less than five years. If the patient comes with a syncope, about they die within three years. If they have heart failure, they die within two years. So the average prognosis is two to five years. And this is mainly for patients described in 1968. The diagnosis was not as good as nowadays. And now what we understand is if you have a patient who presenting with a syncope and they have a critical aortic stenosis, the survival of this patient is only six months. 50% of the patient will die within six months. So we take that very seriously. We admit these patients to the hospital and we don't allow them to be discharged before we treat them. So if we look at the survival, to put that into perspective, we all worry about metastatic cancer. If you have a patient who has severe aortic stenosis that is not a candidate for surgery, their mortality is way more than metastatic, ovarian, prostate, breast cancer, or lung cancer. So we really need to stay on top of these patients. And we're very fortunate that there are new treatment options. The most common reason depends on age. So the elderly, that the patient that we encounter in our clinic more of, most often, are they have senile degeneration of the aortic valve. The younger patients tend to have either a rheumatic valve or a congenital bicuspid or unicuspid aortic valve. So how do we grade it? So with atherosclerosis, there is like a degenerative changes of the, the trileaflet aortic valve. There is a build of calcium, a build of atherosclerosis in the aortic valve. The mechanism is, remains unknown until the valve becomes very tight, doesn't open very well. And then usually the consensus is if the gradient is uh, above 40 millimeter mercury or the velocity is above four millimeter per, meter per second, that's considered severe aortic valve stenosis. So what are the treatment options? The, Traditional treatment option is doing surgery, mechanical valve or a bioprosthetic valve. And we're fortunate nowadays we have like a platform of like about six, seven uh, valves that are available. We can introduce them through transcatheter options. When do we treat aortic valve stenosis? We usually treat the patient when they start to have symptoms. But as I showed you in the figure, many patients they might be asymptomatic for a long time before we, they come to our attention. There is an increasing understanding there is an ongoing damage to the ventricle until the patient starts to develop symptoms. So probably we need to think about catching these patients earlier and evaluating them uh, uh, in a better way. One way we do to declare, to, to declare if the patient has symptoms or not is to do an exercise and stress test. You take a patient who has a severe aortic valve stenosis, you put him on the treadmill, which might sounds like counterintuitive, but it's a class 2B in the guidelines. We put the patient on the treadmill, we help them to exercise, and we assess how much they can go. And I can tell you from the practice, from our clinic and our practice, there are many patients who will tell us, like, we can walk miles, and we put them on the treadmill, and they cannot go more than two to three minutes. And that declared that they have symptomatic severe aortic valve stenosis. What happened most of the time is the patient cuts down on their uh, physical activity to keep up with, uh, with what they can do without noticing it. So what is transcatheter aortic valve replacement? And some of you probably are familiar with this, probably had some patients with it. We go usually from the groin through the transfemoral artery, we cross the aortic valve. They have two valve platforms. One of them is mounted on a balloon. We base the heart very fast so we precisely uh we precisely position the valve and then we inflate a balloon that deploys the new valve the way we use it is we rely on the sizing by using ct scan so we get the right size of the valve 
And we try to oversize about the size of the annulus where we deploy the valve and we rely on the calcium on the liquid to hold the valve in place. And we position the valve and this other platform is made of mentanol. So it's crimped over a catheter and a cold ice. So it maintains its shape. And then we take it and we place it inside the aortic valve and then we release it slowly. And with the warm blood start to expand and it takes the position of the valve. The first transcatheter aortic valve was deployed in 2002 by Dr. Alain Cribier in, in France. And since this, uh, and this is, as you see, this is the patient 15 minutes after the procedure, looking at the camera, smiling. It's very fascinating in comparison to having a major open heart surgery. And since the first deployment in 2002, TABR was studied in different population spectrum. First, in the extreme risk patients. And these are the patients that I mentioned to you, their mortality is even worse than metastatic cancer. So the survival uh, it, uh, is much better if we do TAVR to these patients in comparison to, the, to not doing anything. So the FDA approved it. Then it was studied in patients who are high risk for surgery compared to doing surgical aortic valve replacement versus TAVR, and the outcome was equivalent. And then the FDA approved it for this group of patients. Then it was studied in patients who are at an immediate risk for complication during surgery. So it was also shown to be non-inferior to surgery, maybe superior in certain circumstances. And it was FDA approved. And finally, was studied in the low-risk patients. And the outcome was very, was very, uh, very good as well comparable to surgery, and it was approved. If you review the guidelines for the valve, there has been a paradoxical change in the way we approach uh, valve treatment. And there has been a significant up, like updates on the versions of the guidelines after each of these trials was completed. So this is the old guideline of saying only for intermediate, maybe high-risk patients, we can consider TAPR. This is old. The new guidelines came in 2020. And pretty much what the guidelines tell us, if your patient is 80 years or, old, or older, then we should do TAVR. We should try to avoid surgery. If the patient is anywhere between 65 to 80 years, then surgery or TAVR are equal. If the patient is younger and you expect a longer life expectancy and the patient is healthy otherwise, so they suggest using SAVR with a mechanical valve if the patient agrees to that. So you give a patient one surgery. And uh, other than that, we're seeing, like we're studying more patients into this age population. And it, I wouldn't be surprised in the next few years if we have more patients qualify for TAVR than what we have at this, at this time. So these are the two valves that we all need to be familiar with, Sabian valve and Evolute valve. You're gonna see them on the report. These are the most frequently implanted valves in the United States. There are different platforms being studied and approved in Europe right now. In the US, where the studies are, are ongoing, so we we'll expect it to be completed in the next few years. The Sabian valve is the one that requires balloon inflation. The Evolute valve is the internal one that we self-expanding. So this is how they look like. This is the Evolute valve on the left side. We, we put the valve inside the annulus. We release it slowly. We base the heart, this is a pacemaker, and then sometimes we balloon it to stretch it a little bit. And this whole procedure can be done, if it's a straightforward, it can be done in about 30 to 30 minutes to 60 minutes. On the left side of the screen, this is the Sabian valve, crimped on a balloon, and we inflate the balloon. You see the heart is racing fast, so we precisely position it. Inflate the balloon, deploy the valve, and we get we get the participation of the table shortly. So since the introduction of the TAVR, we expect the TAVR volume has increased, like, uh, to increase, and that's what happened. We can see an exponential increase in the number of patients who qualify for TAVR over the last several years. It's like, believe it or not, nowadays, it's very hard to convince a patient to go for surgery. There are certain patients who will still benefit from surgery, and quite often, we will have patients really refusing to go for surgery. They will try to uh, do, they will ask us to perform TAVR on them. So 
despite this increase in TAVL, it's still unfortunate that there are plenty of patients who have severe aortic valve stenosis and they are underdiagnosed and under and undertreated. So if you look at the figure here, these are patients with uh, patients with a normal ejection fraction, no, no heart failure, but they have severe aortic valve stenosis. 30% of them are not offered any treatment, no TAVR, no surgery. So there is clearly a disparity in these patients. And the disparity becomes worse when you have a patient who have a heart failure. Many people will blame it on the heart failure, but the symptoms of the heart failure, I try not to like or feel these patients are too sick, but there is an opportunity for us to intervene and help these patients. We had, I've personally taken care of patients who had an EF of 30%. We placed the tablet on them and their EF recovered. And they were back to their normal, normal life with a procedure, uh, procedure that usually takes less than an hour and the patient is usually discharged home the next day if everything goes well. I will pause here and will ask the audience if you guys have any questions about uh, about this before we move to another another uh, new invention. I don't see anything in the chat box just yet, but I don't. If anybody has any comments or questions, please feel free to put those there or unmute. All right, so we'll move to the other common scenario. So I know family medicine doctors, you guys take care of many patients with heart failure. And one thing like the treatment of heart failure, if we review also the guidelines and the history of heart failure, uh, there is a paradigm shift to new medication coming every year. There are uh, new interventions, new devices to affect the remodeling. I'll talk to you about a common situation called, uh, that uh, we encounter frequently and we may help these patients, it's, which is severe mitral valve regurgitation. This is a lady who took care of her 65-year-old. She had non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Her ejection fraction was 35. We placed her on the optimal medical therapy, beta blocker, and tristo, spironolactone, Lasix, and dabagliflozine. And she had the lift bundle, so we placed a CRT a device and a defibrillator. And despite that, she had still class two to three NYHA classification symptoms. And then her echocardiogram, we can see this is the mitral valve and this color jet is going to the atrium from the ventricle to the atrium. That, if that affects the forward flow of the blood. So she has severe mitral valve regurgitation. So there is a new shift in the uh, way we approach these patients over the last several years. We have a trial that was very positive that we will talk about. When we think about mitral regurgitation, we think about incompetent mitral valve closure, and that can happen due to a problem with the valve itself, due to either, so to review the mitral valve apparatus, usually the papillary muscle connected with cords to the leaflet to keep the leaflet in place. So during systole, the leaflet should co-act and they should come next to each other to prevent blood from regurgitating. In primary MR, where the problem is the valve itself, usually there are cords that are ruptured or a leaflet tip that's ruptured from the cord, and that can cause a severe mitral valve regurgitation or an injury to the bad muscle. The most common scenario is the secondary mitral valve regurgitation. And that, some, that happens sometimes because of the heart failure itself, because the left ventricle is weak and dilated, and that can stretch the leaflet apart from each other resulting in regurgitation of the blood to the left atrium. And sometimes many of these patients have uh, atrial fibrillation as well. And with atrial fibrillation, the atrium doesn't contract. So the atrium gets bigger and that can pull the annulus where the mitral valve is inserted and uh, apart from each other. And that result in stretching the leaflet away from each other. And that result in significant mitral valve regurgitation. These are very common. We see them in quite often in patients with heart failure. And why it's important, if you have a patient who has significant mitral valve regurgitation that's primary, again, many of the patients don't have symptoms for a long time. And once they start to have symptoms and if they have risk factors, we can see how their survival drops significantly over the year. By 10 years, about 70% of the patients will, or 50% of the patient will be dead 
if we don't intervene on their mitral gut. If the patient has a ruptured leaflet, and that's plain leaflet, and if they don't have symptoms at the time we encounter them, within three years, for sure they will have symptoms and their mortality is 30, 34% per year. It's very, very bad prognosis. That's why we tend to screen these patients and treat them early, as early as possible. When you talk about mitral regurgitation, that will lead to increase uh, volume, more stretch on the ventricle, more myocardial injury, more heart failure and LV dysfunction, more LV dilation. And as a result, you end up with a vicious circle where the mitral regurg makes the left ventricle worse and the left ventricle makes the mitral regurg worse. So it's a, it's, it's a double whammy for the patient. How does mitral regurgitation uh, present with symptoms? Mainly they present with symptoms of heart failure. So, and as we see here, it takes several years before we start to see a hit on the ventricle or when we start to see the patient to have significant symptoms. So how many patients with mitral regurgitation are there in the US? And the surveillance from 2009, the prevalence of having significant MR is about 4 million patients. And there are about 1.7 million, about almost half of them are candidates for surgical for treatment. Each year we diagnose about a half a million, a quarter of a million of patients with a new mitral regurgitation. And when we look at the treatment, we are really not doing a very good job in treating these patients. Only 2% of the patients are treated by surgery, either because these patients are very sick, they have a heart failure, and they have the mitral valve together. And surgery, when we have, we all know, one of the things that increase the mortality in surgery is when there was a heart failure uh, situation and that the mortality in these patients increase significantly uh, uh, if the patient has heart failure. So we probably need to do a better job in treating uh, these patients. So what's, what do the guidelines tell us for intervention? If the patient has primary MR, we treat them whenever they start to have signs and symptoms of heart failure or whenever they drop their ejection fraction. At that time, we start to refer them for surgery. If they are asymptomatic and you have a good surgeon and a good success rate above 95%, and the surgeon is very efficient in doing a valve repair, that's the time we can offer these patients surgery if we expect the mortality to be less than 1%. So this does not usually apply to patients with heart failure, uh, I mean, with a low ejection fraction and secondary mitral valve regurgitation. And we see it like there is a consistent evidence that if we intervene early, uh, uh, the outcome is usually better. So what are the treatment options that we have right now for mitral valve regurgitation? With the surgeon, when they do surgery, usually they try to repair the leaflet and place the ring to perform annuloplasty, meaning bring the, with the insertion of the mitral valve closer to each other so the liquid can collapse better, can replace valve, the valve with a mechanical valve. The caveat of that is the patient needs to be on anticoagulation. There is a risk of bleeding, a risk of stroke as well. With a tissue valve, life expectancy of 10 to 15 years, and over the, last, the past several years, the mitral clip has been studied and there are exciting results that I would love to share with you about. So transcatheter mitral valve repair with a mitral clip or edge-to-edge -edge repair, the other term of it, it has been approved for both the generative primary MR as well as a secondary MR. And the clip looks like it's almost like the size of a dime. It has two arms and it has grippers uh, and they are connected with a nentinol uh, string. We go through the groin, transfemoral groin, we do transeptal puncture from the right atrium to the left atrium. And this, this a steerable catheter allows us to put so many curves. All of these procedures are guided by transthoracic echocardiogram, a trans, uh, transesophageal echocardiogram. We go into the leaflet and we try to grasp the leaflet and we try to put the leaflet back to each other to restore the coaptation plane. And uh, the results of this, the main trial is called the coapt trial. The focus is to restore the coaptation in these patients, meaning the, uh, the two leaflets touching each other. And in this uh, trial, they involve patients who have heart failure with low ejection fraction. They, all of the patients had severe mitral valve regurgitation. 
they placed all patients on the, on the guideline directed medical therapy and they compared doing mitraclip with medical therapy versus medical therapy alone, which is like uh, what we usually do. And we can see there is a great early separation of the Kabla Meyer curves, and there is a significant improvement in the cumulative heart failure hospitalization. These patients really feel better after uh, the mitra clip, and they found a signal of significant improvement in the uh, survival. So to put this into perspective, we all put our patients on ACE or ARBs or Entresto, beta blocker, steroid, and this curve shows you how much you decrease the mortality by adding each one of these medications. So beta blocker is the most effective treatment in decreasing uh, uh, mortality in patients with heart failure with low EF, about 30%. And if we add the mitra clip on top of all of these medical therapies and all of the devices, there was a significant reduction in the mortality in these patients by about 40%. And the number needed to treat is only 3.4. Very impressive. Like for every three patients you treat, one of the patients will get. You need to treat three patients to save the life of one patient. One of the most effective uh, therapies that we we use for these patients with heart failure. So this is the result of our patients. We see on the top picture, we admitted our patient with, she was like, of course, because she has heart failure, she was high risk for surgery as well. So we see here the regurgitation, the red color into the left atrium before the clip. Now we place the clip here. You see, you barely see any regurgitation. We place two clips in this patient and uh, the patient was discharged on next day. And it's fascinating, all of this can be done through a small hole in the femoral vein. That's all the uh, that's all what they get for the report to be able to do the to do the procedure. So I'll pause here before we move move to uh, so the other the, before we pause, there are other options we can do for these patients. Some certain patients have surgical valves placed. Sometimes we can place a valve inside it. Those with rheumatic mitral valve stenosis as well. We can balloon the valve to stretch it. We can do uh, these interventions here at University, uh, University of Texas. And there are multiple devices right now, transcatheter options to embrace the mitral valve in development. The one that has promising results is the tendine valve. It has an apical approach, small wound through the apex. This one is called M3. We put a band around the mitral valve and we deploy a valve inside it. And again, all of these procedures can be done through the groin uh, access, similar to heart catheterization. And the patient, uh, we are seeing increasing, uh, increasingly favorable outcomes. And we like the patients usually get discharged the day, a day after the procedure. So I'll pause here and I'll take any questions before we move to a different case scenario. I don't have any still in the chat box. I don't know if you're able to see it or not, but I've been keeping an eye out here for you. Oh, okay. So please, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, so the the next scenario is uh, is a common scenario, I think, especially as family medicine and geriatrician doctors, you guys take care of this very frequently. Uh, we always talk about anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation. So AFib is a disease of the elderly. And here we have an 85-year-old lady, uh, classic. She has hypertension, congestive heart failure. She had a prior stroke. So she has AFib. So she was placed on anticoagulation, PID. Her CHAD vessel score was seven, very high risk. And she unfortunately has balance issues. So she tripped. She had a mechanical fall. She hit her head. She had an epidural hematoma. So she Covered from that, we stopped their anticoagulation. And the question is, what should we do to prevent her from having a stroke? We cannot place her on anticoagulation anymore because of her significant bleeding. She already bled almost, almost had this conse significant consequences from her trauma. And she had the stroke before. Her chest vessel score is very high, translates into 7% risk of a stroke every year. And the question, what can we offer her? to prevent her or decrease her risk of having a stroke. 
So we have a stroke prevention program. We started that as well as part of our structural heart team. Mainly we focus on patients with atrial fibrillation as well as patients with a cryptogenic uh, stroke. I'll talk to you about atrial fibrillation since it's some, something common in your practice. So as we grow older, there is a five-time increase risk, uh, like our risk of AFib increases significantly. And the patient has this risk of stroke uh, with atrial fibrillation up to five times. And if we look at the patients who had a stroke, one in five patients with a stroke had atrial fibrillation. And among patients with atrial fibrillation, 47% uh, of them, they will have a stroke. And the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is increasing significantly. By 20, 2050, we are expecting uh, more than a double in the incidence of atrial fibrillation. About 5 million of our patients will have at, uh, atrial fibrillation. Most of the stroke in AFib comes from the left atrial appendage. And you see here, it's transesophageal echo. There is a left atrial appendage. There is a promise in the left atrial appendage. And that's why we usually, why we do TE cardioversion to rule that possibility. The risk of stroke increases as the chance vascular score increases. And uh, which, that's why we anticoagulate these patients with either a uh, direct auto anticoagulation or warfarin. However, we all encounter these medications are not, uh, they are safe when they are safe, but when they are not safe, they have a lot of problems. They have a bleeding risk. They are daily patients to take them. We all know that there is a problem with adherence to the medication. 50 patients or 50% 50 of the patients who are prescribed anticoagulation, they do not take them. Coumadin, you need to monitor their INR. There are a lot of food interaction. And if they are getting the procedure, that you need to stop it, bridge it, they have a higher cost. So what can we offer these uh, patients and in particular this lady? We, there are two devices developed over the last several years. One of the common uh, ones and the currently approved one in the US are Watchman device and amulet device. And the goal of these devices is to occlude the left atrial appendage. And we see here on the left side, this is a Watchman device. It's like almost like a ball. It's very safe, very atraumatic. We go in through the groin as well, and we place a catheter into the left atrial appendage, and we deploy the device. The device is sheath, is uh, crimped inside the sheath. We put the sheath and we unsheath it and place it there. The other device was approved earlier this year called the Amplatzer annular device. It has two discs, stays at the left atrium, and then it covers the whole left atrium. And the data for this, these devices, so the watchman was compared to using, there are multiple trials about it. The landmark trial that came recently compared the DUOC, uh, direct oral anticoagulation versus watchman. The watchman was non inferior in the cumulative incidence of having a stroke when it's compared to a liquid. And the primary endpoints were very similar. So the watchman had, was a brute. Uh, by the FDA for that reason, I mean, after these mm -hmm. trials. And then the second trial compared the amulet device to the watchman, which, which was a sudden, and showed the new devices also non inferior to the watchman device. So these devices were uh, uh, approved and they are reflected in the guidelines. It's a, a class 2B uh, in our <coughs> AFIP uh, guidelines. If the patient had stroke or TIA, in the setting of non valvular atrial fibrillation, and they have a contraindication to lifelong anticoagulation, but they can tolerate at least 45 days of the treatment, we can consider them for the watchman device. The amulet hasn't made it to the guidelines, it just came this year, so we expect it to be included in the guidelines in one to two years. And how do the how uh, how do we do these procedures? Usually it takes about 30 minutes. We go through the groin with the catheter. We do a transeptal puncture similar to the mitral plug. Here's the catheter and the left atrial appendage. We inject contrast. We see the left atrial appendage here. And then we deploy the device and we see complete sealing of the left atrial appendage. Usually we put the patient on either 45 days of anticoagulation and then we repeat a transesophageal echo to make sure the device is sealed. Usually the body builds tissue on the device and the device gets endothelialized. So that's how the patient doesn't need to be an anticoagulation anymore. Uh, we usually do aspirin blavix for six months and then aspirin lifelong. And then the patient does not need to be an anticoagulation anymore. So 
I will pause here. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer to answer them. I do have one that came in the chat to me. Um, someone asked, access to care remains a significant challenge for uninsured patients in Texas. What resources are available for these patients who would clearly benefit from valve repair replacement interventions? Absolutely. So CareLink, we talked to multiple, uh, to our CareLink leadership. So they, uh, we will, uh, for the Mitra Club and the Taver, we are getting approval on case by case, uh, case by case basis. So if you have a patient who doesn't have insurance, who's really symptomatic, who you think it could benefit from valve intervention, please send us their information. We'll try to help them to uh, to be approved by CareLink so we can cover these uh, these devices. Currently, CareLink covers surgery for uh, for valves. They are covering TAVR on case by case basis. I, we expect next year it will be for all care link patients, but as of now, they're doing it case by case basis. We would like to see like good outcomes with like, like a sample of patients before they approve it for everyone. It's kind of one of the requirement they ask us to do. So uh, we are going through that. For the watchman procedure, it's if the patient has care link we care link covers watchmen and covers all the rest of the procedures that uh, we usually do the only things is the clip and the tavern they 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 are on case by case basis does that answer your question i will let them respond to me in the chat to make sure but i did have another question come directly to me it says what are the indications for watchmen other than contraindication of bleeding is the chads fax score criteria uh sure so usually if you have a chance fast to score above two which is an indication for putting these patients on anticoagulation and for any reason the patient cannot take anticoagulation so whether is it uh, prior bleeding hypo risk uh like uh, uh these are the gi bleeding uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, any of that, uh, that we take it into consideration. The one that's in the guidelines actually also allow us if the patient is not compliant with anticoagulation, and the guidelines also allow us to do these procedures in these patients, and we take it on a case by case. I had a patient last week, he's very competent, and he said, I will never, I mean, I will never take anticoagulation, no matter what you say. And he had like a high chance vascular score. So we submitted him through the insurance and he was approved and we did this watchman device. We placed him on aspirin and prolenta. He's going to complete six months of that and then aspirin lifelong. So these are uh, the patients that we quite often encounter. There is an ongoing trial with watchmen for everyone. We expect the result to come in the next couple of years. They are enrolling very well to the trial. Uh, so we will get more answers. I wouldn't be surprised that doing watchmen for everyone is going to be the new thing, but we're not there yet. I don't have any other questions, but I did get a thank you, I think, to your previous response. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next procedure is something new. We started like earlier this year when I joined. It's a common scenario. You all encountered this, you all hate this situation, and we do the same as well, but we are fortunate there are sometimes potential for new options. 35-year-old lady comes with MSSA bacteremia, IV drug abuser, and she had chest pain, pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, and she was in septic shock, and you see here there are cavitary lesions in her lung, and then the next test is uh, we do is echocardiogram to look for endocarditis. And this is a echocardiogram. This is a tricuspid valve leaflet, the anterior and posterior leaflet. And she has a large vegetation of the tricuspid valve. And she was showering this vegetation to her spine, uh, to her lung, and sometimes showering distally to that, to her spine. And we always, and we see another, another picture on transesophageal echo. The vegetation is flickering on the tricuspid valve. We call for surgery. Surgery always says she's a high risk for surgery because of risk of reinfection. 
and then we don't know what to do with these patients. If you look at the guidelines, the guidelines tell us we need to do surgery whenever there is a valve dysfunction and the patient is in heart failure, when there, whenever there is a left-sided infective endocarditis by specific organisms, if the patient has an evidence of advanced and like and, uh, endocarditis, such as a heart block, aortic abscess, penetrating lesions, or if they have persistent bacteremia despite antibiotic use, and they uh, they suggest if the vegetation is greater than a centimeter with embolic phenomenon similar to our patients, is to proceed with surgery. And I will ask, would like to ask the audience, how many times have you seen a surgeon taking patients with infective endocarditis and heart failure to surgery and IV drug abuse? Personally, I haven't seen it ever. I've seen it in one patient, and that patient got, got and that's correct, Rachel. Like I see your response almost never. That patient got infected. The new valve got infected. And there is a reason why our surgeons wouldn't take them uh, because of the risk of reinfection and the ongoing IV drug use. So, what do we do? So, the whenever endocarditis is bad, there is about 20 to 50 percent risk of embolization. This is how it looks like on the mitral valve. And uh, surgery, 30, 40 percent uh, of the patient eventually would get surgery if they recover, if they prove they are not using drugs anymore. If uh, an early surgery has been shown, when you do it, it's improved survival. And the common scenario is we have patients who have a device, if the patient has an ICD and then the vegetation on the device. And when, if we don't remove the device, then the patient, usually they have a very high mortality, up to 30% in one year. And while you're removing the device, if you have vegetation on the device, you may shower that to the lung and you may have bad outcomes. The new device we started is called AngioVac. It has been in the has been uh, available like for the last several years. We we're fortunate to have it here uh, with different versions. It's essentially a heart pump. You put two catheters, one cannula in the heart, and this is how it looks like on X-ray. And it's guided by transesophageal echo. You take it, you point it to the area of the station. You aspirate, you filter, and you give the blood back to the patient. And this is what we did for uh, this patient. We did an angiovac, so we took the cannula, and you see here the tricuspid valve, there is no vegetation at all. In this particular patient, there's, uh, the patient has severe regurgitation to start with, it remained the same at the end of the procedure. This is not a replacement for surgery, but it might be a bridge to help the patient recover faster, allowing the patient to join the rehab for the drug abuse. And eventually, the patient will need surgery. So it's not really a replacement, but it might help other uh, patients. This is an example of the case of the rib. This is a vegetation. This is how it looks like after vegetation. So let's talk a little bit for the sake of time on the AgioVac. This is how it works. We put the return cannula through either the groin or the neck. Uh, and the aspiration cannula through the neck or the groin, and with the contralateral axis, we put a uh, return cannula. Blood goes through the filter, gets filtered, and we infuse the blood back. We can go through the neck, through the groin. Uh, people have def done different situations. This is a patient who had who convinced the surgeon to get surgery for tricuspid valve. Unfortunately, went to doing the drugs again, and this is how you see the prosthetic valve on the tricuspid. Uh, position how much infection she has on the valve. She underwent the angiovac procedure. We removed all of this from her valve. She was in cardiogenic shock with a gradient about 15 across the valve. She recovered. She normalized her LFTs and coagulation and eventually sent for surgery for a valve replacement and debridement. Again, it's like not a replacement for surgery, it's a bridge for surgery. There is a, we are unfortunately one of the most common hospitals that encounter patients with endocarditis. And this is like looking at uh, the data in Texas and like in, that, in 2012, 21 till about September, we had about 99 patients diagnosed with infective endocarditis. So it's a common, a common scenario. So the data for this is mainly coming from observational study. For the sake of time, I can tell you most of the procedures are done less than an hour. 
blood loss is very minimal. The, uh, uh, the indication variable based on the, uh, some patients have a masses, so we restrict them with, uh, we can restrict them with NGVAC. Some of them have clots. And uh, the device is pretty much, the procedure itself is usually safe. Mortality in this registry was about 1.3%. And pretty much, like pretty much overall, it's a safe, safe procedure. The complication risk is less than 5% if we include everything together. So the other data came from patients before removing the uh, device extraction for ICD or pacemaker, and that uh, they aspirated the vegetation from the lead, and then they removed the procedure safely. And it's a high risk procedure to start with, but overall, combining the device removal as well as the infection removal, mortality is less as about 3% in this uh, group of patients. So I'll pause here, take uh, any questions about this. All right, so I'll move to the next one because we started uh, like in the sake of time and now about 45 minutes. Uh, so it's, uh, we started to participate as well now with the PER team, for the PE team at, uh, at University Hospital with our interventional radiology colleague. If you have a patient who's really sick, please call us and we're happy to, to come expedite the work up for these patients uh, and the treatment. This is a common situation. Uh, this is a, hopefully not, not common, but this is a scenario encountered earlier when we joined this year. 64, he came to the ED with a syncope, and he was uh, uh, he was half purple by EMS. And by the time he arrived to the ED, he was awake, talking to us, but he was desetting, he was complaining of abdominal pain. His EKG is showing maybe a steel elevation in the anterior lead, so they activated us for that reason. If you study the EKGs closely, he has the ST elevation in the anterior lead, but that's also what, the new, what looks like a new right bundle branch block. We see S1, Q3, non-specific T wave changes in lead three. We were not sure if this is a STEMI or this is a PE. So we put an echo in his chest, his RV is big. And we said, we'll take him to the cath lab. We shoot his coronaries and we evaluate, we do pulmonary angiogram at the same time to establish the diagnosis. While we're talking to him, consenting him, he coded. CPR was started. We took him to the cath lab, and at the cath lab, the patient was coding. So the first thing we did is we placed the patient on ECMO, stabilized the patient, and you see here the ECMO cannula. Immediately, we performed coronary angiogram. This is the right vessel. There is no culprit for STEMI. We injected on the left side as well. The coronaries look very clean. Then we go to the pulmonary angiogram, and this is injecting the contrast in the pulmonary angiogram. And we see there is a drop, there is a clot in the right lower pulmonary artery. There is a huge thrombus in this area. So while he's in the cath lab, we, there are now three different devices that we can use to aspirate clots. So we did aspiration thrombectomy for him. And uh, this is the catheter sitting there and we aspirated all the clot. This is what came out of his lung and, uh, and his oxygenation and he became hemodynamically stable right away after, after we did this. So this is an option that we, we started to collaborate with our uh, interventional radiology. We are part of the PER team right now and we are happy to see your patients. Even if you're not sure and want us to review the CAT scan, please call us and we're happy to do that whenever you encounter a patient uh, with uh, with a massive or submassive pulmonary embolism. So in summary, there are evolving transcatheter treatments. Uh, we talked about TAVR, aortic stenosis. Uh, we can do that also for regurgitation, but it's under trials for now. Mitroclip, we are starting as well uh, for clips for tricuspid valve. We also perform alcohol septal ablation for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We talked about Watchman and Amulet. And so we talked about the injury back and uh, aspiration of clots and devices from the heart removal. And uh, it's an evolving field. There are multiple, many devices in development. And we're very fortunate that we have these options now at the University Hospital for our patients. Our team is happy to see your patients within 24 hours. 
whenever you call us, we are happy to review things either remotely or if the patient is admitted in the hospital. And if you're not sure, if you just send us the information and we're happy to take care of your patients from A, A to Z. And uh, like just connect us with the patient, we'll take care of their workup completely. We'll order their echoes, their scans, we'll arrange it for them to be seen by the surgeon. And we, we take pride about what we do and we're happy, we're happy to help all of our patients. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my to my talk. Please feel free if you have a question or a comment, you can unmute or put that in the chat box if you'd like. Um, I also did put the link for us to give um, some feedback. So if you can just help us out with that, but please feel free to comment or put questions. Well, I don't see anything else and I forgot to tell you, I did get another thank you on the um, second question that you answered uh, for us. So with that, um, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us um, your presentation and I hope everybody has a great day. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thanks.